Hi, Nishant. Um, I'm Kurt Roloff and uh, very happy to be here interviewing you today about your uh, book, uh, Data Privacy, which is, of course, available on Amazon and all fine bookstores across the world. Um, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I have a couple of prepared questions, but uh, before I launch into it, would you just maybe say a few words about yourself, your background and, and what you're trying to achieve in, in your book? Uh, thank you again for having me on, on here. Uh, my name is Nishant Pajaria. I'm the Director of Privacy Engineering at Uber, although I will hasten to add that I'm here on my personal capacity. Sure. I wrote this book as sort of the collection or the anthology of career experiences in the security and the privacy space. So I began my career as an engineer back in the day. Then I led product and edge teams. But what I'm doing now in my career is making sure that we build safer, more trustworthy platforms for customers across the world. So I'm thinking about people like my dad, for whom the tech industry is at once extremely opaque, and on the other side, something he deems indispensable. So I'm writing for those customers and for the engineers who build stuff for those customers so that we can have a platform and a customer experience that is worthy of trust and reliability. If you look at engineers today, they tend to get siloed. They tend to own one product, one vertical line, and nobody can, as a result, build a platform that collectively represents the best controls that every company should have. So I've written this for engineers so they can be more complete, well-rounded engineers from a privacy perspective, whether or not they have dedicated privacy training. I've also written this book for attorneys, for folks on the legal side, marketing side, people on the media, people in the regulatory business, or even people in government, because when you talk about privacy and security, these fields are not things people typically understand very well or know where to start. So this book is aimed at a, as a run book for all of those diverse audiences, even though the title explicitly lists engineers. So that's all I'm trying to do here, change the world, build around a new consensus of ideas in a way that the tech industry is seen as an ally of people across the board, not just the VCs who make money off of us. Well, thank you very much for the high level intro. So why don't we kind of, you know, dig into a few kind of main points. One thing I really enjoyed about how you really grounded the book in, in use cases and was driven through, I assume, personal experience, but also cases in the news, uh, you know, for example, various kinds of breaches and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, maybe kind of start from there about community, like, you know, these use cases, are these things that you've heard anecdotally from others or the things where you were consulting? Like where, where, where do you ground your experience and the use cases that you were driving from the book? Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned the actual use cases and personal stories because I have courses on LinkedIn Learning, obviously I have the book, a number of podcasts, and people across the spectrum, be it engineers or non-engineers, they tell me that they relate to the stories and it makes it easier for them to understand the actual solution behind the curtain because the stories humanize the actual content and it also means that the stories that I have to tell are similar to stories other people have felt as well in their life. So I feel it's interesting, even though we are all technologists or attorneys, the human aspect of connecting to narratives doesn't leave us ever. But the reason I ground myself in these stories is because the story for me begins in 2003, after I finished my undergrad. I was in New York in Times Square and I was with my dad. He had flown in all the way from Mumbai and he wanted to see the Times Square area. So at the time I was living in the Midwest and working for big companies like Intel, Google, Uber was kind of a pipe dream. So I stood outside the, the ticker in Times Square and I told my dad, one day I'll work for one of these companies and make sure that my resume has a heavy name on it too. And now I have a bunch of heavy names. So, but right about the time I've gotten there in my career, I have a book out. The tech industry does not quite have the best reputation. I'm not sure what's more unpopular right now, big tech or big tobacco. I would think big tech because at least big tobacco claims that they create a lot of jobs for people in those states across the country that are not often visited. So. I ground myself in the fact that big tech is known to create a ton of wealth, but not a ton of work. And that's something that is at the heart of the tech lash. We disrupt people's lives. We create a ton of efficiencies, but that has impacts upon the communities that we don't always foresee. So I ground my experience in the fact that there is great potential in big tech, thanks to talented engineers who do great work, but somehow how we do those things, how we create those wealth values, don't quite make sense, doesn't quite make sense to people who are not in the tech industry. So I ground myself in the gap between the technologists on the one side and the unwitting consumers on the other side. So that's where I ground myself because that space needs somebody to connect right now. And I don't see very many people doing that. So I'm a startup co-founder focused on privacy technologies. I, I was also at some time a tenured professor in cybersecurity. And, and mm -hmm. so I'm very interested in career paths. What, what kind of backgrounds do you think fit really well into folks that want to go into the privacy space? Is it folks with a, is a business sense? Is it, is it feel more legalistic backgrounds? Are, are there certain kinds of technologists that seem to just be gravitating 
towards the privacy field, just in general. And I'm really yeah. glad you are optimizing for career paths because at the end of the day, people respond to incentives. And for the last 10 years, the last 10 go-go years, uh, the engineers have been told, build amazing services. We will reduce the process burden for you. You have your own CI CD pipeline, your own S3 availability zones. Nobody's going to create a ton of process. So we've told engineers that this is the world that you can live in right now. And, and frankly, that has been a great world for everybody because it has led to a ton of amazing products. Remember back 15 years ago when I used to write code, it took a long time to get permissions. It took a long time to get access, yep. let alone requisitioning for finances. And giving engineers these flexibility has been amazing for the companies and their shareholders, for engineers' careers, and for customers as well. The problem now is from a privacy and security perspective, your ability to trust the platform is pretty much short if those two basic requirements aren't met. And I think of privacy as being the Trojan horse. I don't know how many engineers come to your show and talk about old literature, but privacy is both an opportunity and a risk. If you think about privacy as a Trojan horse for access, you think about it this way. If you understand privacy well, you understand the different stakeholders in the company, you understand the dependency on data, you understand aspects about access control, you understand third-party partnerships. So you now have the ability to protect the platform in a very meaningful way, in a way that is not possible for engineers that are focused on just their products. So engineers today can become architects tomorrow and thought leaders because privacy requires them to think about the platform holistically. And they can look at not just the customer through the lens of data, but they can look at the data through the lens of the customer as well. So I think of privacy as a career progression model because you can now speak for the entire organization in a way that many other engineers cannot. But from a skill set perspective, I would say, think about partly full stack, partly back end, partly front end, understanding how you work with privacy legal, security legal, compliance teams, audit teams, PR teams, comms teams. You don't teach this stuff in school, by the way. I don't know which school teaches you all this, all these things. There's only the school of real life. And that is why I have a ton more gray hair than somebody my age should have right now. But I feel like you can build your career in a, in a way that you may not have thought possible. So I would not think of a specific skill set that either meets the bar or doesn't meet the bar, except to say that you need to have the ability and the desire to make an impact beyond just one product or one business line or one geo. That flexibility, that ambition to make a difference at the platform level is pretty key. And then the other hard skills will follow. So let me kind of, you know, poke in at one thing that you said, you know, specifically about, you know, talk the talk and, and walk the walk as it is, you know, with respect to, to privacy. And one thing that I found as, you know, we deploy privacy products and, and, and communicate about privacy products with our sponsors and customers is the need to facilitate relationships between different organizational units. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, CISOs versus chief data officer versus business units. How do you often talk about privacy? You know, one thing that struck me in the book that you, you had written was that you often ground things in terms of, you know, regulatory justifications and, and things like that. You know, and, and one thing that I always think about is about whether I'm talking with someone from a profit center or a cost center and what that actually means with respect to justifications. How do you see, you know, overall the constellation of relationships that a privacy professional should be mindful of as they're starting to advocate for privacy tools and, and improving privacy in an, in an organization such as a large company? And that's a, such a great question. And that's why I wrote a chapter specifically towards the end of the book, I think it's chapter 11, that talks about how do you actually scale privacy engineering in a way that benefits the business. So. How you make the case depends upon the company, but let's think about sort of what would be common across the board. And I make the argument with three pillars. The first is risk, which is, do you want to be in a situation where suddenly something blows up and you can never recover from it? Like you could make the argument that GDPR was passed primarily to hold big tech responsible, like accountable. Now we're going to not look at stock prices right now because the last three, three or four weeks have been brutal. So I'm not going to add salt to a festering wound, but let's use maybe the early part of this year as a framework. I remember I was part of Google when GDPR became official. And I remember if you look at the stock price for Google and Facebook on the day GDPR was passed, and then fast forward two or three years, the stock price has almost doubled, in some cases tripled, again, until the most recent uh, bear market took over. So if the goal of GDPR was to hold big tech accountable, frankly, it didn't quite pan out. But GDPR did provide you a sort of a framework on how to think about and what to build for. And if you do those things, you reduce actual security and privacy risk, both from the, the breach perspective and the fine perspective, but you also make the business better. If you reduce the size of data you have on your team and you make sure that the only data you have is the data you know you need, and you force engineers to own the data rather than just collecting it and worrying about it after the fact, you now have to spend less to store data because last time I checked, cloud storage was not free. 
you will have to spend a lot less money to manage access control and encrypt data. So you are actually being a more careful, conscientious custodian of the company's financial resources. That's number two. So you want to make the argument from a risk and a financial efficiency perspective. It sells very well if you pair the two together. But the third thing you do from a tooling perspective is you will demonstrate that these tools are hard to build because we have incentivized, as I mentioned before, the engineers uh, to basically own just their roadmap, right? And now you are building a different kind of engineer. You will have to build an engineer that is staffed and tracked correctly with existing skill sets within the company, but also new skill sets. You can have an engineer that can work on something different today versus something totally different tomorrow, which means hiring becomes a lot easier. You could pay a lot of money for engineers down the road, or you could upskill your engineers right now and take a swing out at attrition and make sure that people don't leave as much and also make sure that you can hire engineers correctly going, going forward. So your job here is to improve regulatory risk by reducing the risk there. You can improve the quality of data and make less work happen for your platform and data service owners. And third, you build better engineers and improve your hiring posture as well. And I think you can achieve all three goals by investing in privacy. That's the argument I make. And if you make an argument like this that speaks to different people in the company, I'm talking about the C-suite, the financial folks, the risk folks, the CISO folks, the CEO folks, I think you have a much better shot, not just to hire people or get better money for tools, but also make sure that you don't have to make disingenuous arguments over and over again. Because one thing that people hate, even at my level, is people coming back for more after committing to a certain roadmap. And these three arguments will make that mean that you will front load the work and make sure that you have fewer surprises going forward. So let me let me then kind of dig in something that you said about the notion of storage and, and storage of data and what that actually means. One thing that that was I think struck me as I was flipping through the book is that early on in the book, the first half, you seem to be focusing on a more of a classical set of approaches, but really bread and butter, solid bread and butter approaches about data stewardship, how one thinks about data storage, taking stock of data. Um, and towards the end of the book, you start focusing much more on notions of the you know, data sharing and potential of data sharing and, and what that actually means for various aspects of, of, of privacy. I assume this is kind of grounded in some sense, the notion of, of privacy technologies and how they might actually be used to enable value for, from data. And I wonder if this might be grounded in a sense of moving data privacy and privacy regulations from a cost center to something that was potentially a profit center as a way of staying regulatory compliant but still processing data and getting more value from the data one has by aggregating data in a privacy protected manner. I wonder if you might want to think about this and maybe just reflect a bit about what's on the horizon with data storage and what this actually means for, for regulatory compliance, but sharing at the same time. Absolutely. So if you look at the Facebook example, and by the way, some of the smartest people in Silicon Valley that I know of in this space work at Facebook. So uh, I speak with some knowledge on this topic, but the mistake with Cambridge Analytica was in 2014. And I think it, if you, unless my facts are completely wrong, which I don't think is the case, what they did was totally appropriate and legal at the time. It was Cambridge that sucked up a lot of data. The instrumentation didn't exist to detect just the volume of egress that was taking place. And Facebook fixed it, but the real blow up happened three years after. So the mistake was in 2014, the remedy in 2015, and the congressional hearings in 2018. So there is often a gap between making that mistake and actually paying a price for it. That's point number one. But I would say, going back to your argument about the profit center, one thing that business and Wall Street hate is uncertainty. And that's what we're learning right now. We don't know where the world is headed. Now, obviously the macro forces at work right now, the war, the pandemic, gas prices, inflation are outside the scope of privacy. But what privacy engineering gives you is a relatively higher degree of certainty. What data do we have? Where do we have it? Who uses it? For what purpose? Who are we sharing it with? These are all questions that can be empirically answered. And privacy engineering will force you to answer all of them. And in the quest to reduce regulatory risk, you are creating better lineage, a better understanding of your, your infrastructure that was built over time by multiple disconnected teams. So privacy is a benefit center. It's, a, it's not a cost center in my opinion, because it may be a cost center in the beginning for the first three to six months, but those costs are not privacy costs. They are costs of organizational immaturity. You will pay for those costs either in a future merger or if something goes wrong or in the quality of data or in bad insights, you are paying the cost anyways. In fact, there is an example in the book where I talk about data analysts timing out because they're all querying against the same expanding data store where they don't know whether their queries will run with, with existing compute power or not. So you are reducing costs for a whole bunch of other teams while reducing organizational risk, while upskilling your worker base. And I feel privacy is an all the way through benefit uh, vector. 
if, if it weren't the case, I wouldn't have my job. I wouldn't have had my last three jobs, right? Because the companies I have worked for historically have enough mature leaders to deal with the risk either before or after the fact. But I talk to startups all the time. I talk to VCs. I talk to think tanks. I talk to people in the media. And they all tell me that they don't understand exactly how things work behind the scenes. And by the way, that's true for engineers who work in the company as well. A lot of what big tech gets wrong comes down to incompetence and not malfeasance. And I'm not sure that's a great argument to make that we're not stupid or sorry, we're not corrupt, we're stupid. But really, it's the world has grown so much. My favorite line in the book is, uh, our modal processing power cannot keep up with our compute processing power. That's how fast big data and the scope around it is growing. So privacy helps you build a bit better, more mature, more connected organization. And you will see, you can compare yourself to other companies that are paying a much higher price, both in terms of operations and in terms of risks as well. So I, I totally agree. But somebody needs to make the argument because too often people in my job make the argument purely through the lens of risk and fines. And frankly, I think that's an opportunity lost because there's a much higher cost you're paying for in terms of just the daily inefficiencies that your engineers have gotten used to. Right. Let, let's actually dig into that and kind of build off the bat a bit because you, you talk about, and uh, I'm paraphrasing you a little bit, and if I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, you know, please correct me. Um, the, the notion of corruption versus stupidity that you think is probably more one than the other. I would even push forward as more of an issue of visibility as opposed to corruption or, 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 or stupidity. And privacy technologies is a way of basically increasing visibility overall to allow groups to interact. I like to think about it is the notion of highly regu regulated environments, uh, such as the uh, financial services or, or medical services, where different parts of banks or different parts of research, medical research centers can't talk to one another for regulatory concerns. And privacy tools allowing groups to better coordinate and be more responsive right. overall, um, if not. I wonder if you might choose from your own examples, you know, what your personal life or in your book, this kind of dichotomy overall, where privacy tools, although it's ostensibly to reduce visibility in some regards, in mm -hmm. some, some way let, lets organizations just be more efficient because they can talk and, and talk in ways that they're not overly restrictive with their engineers or legal or C-suite and, and so forth and, and privacy as a visibility tool for what it is. I'm so glad you brought that up. So when you think about visibility, ask yourself, why do you need visibility? So privacy controls exist to right size visibility. So as an example, if you have access to somebody's streaming history, if you work for a company like Netflix or Hulu or Disney or whatever, um, you have no business as an engineer knowing what a celebrity watched last night. However, you need to be able to get access to people's view viewing history if somebody cannot get into their account or if you're in an account takeover situation. So privacy gives you the opportunity to make more appropriate visibility happen at scale and reduce the risk that somebody can do something terrible without you knowing about it, right? And I mean, every company in Silicon Valley has had that moment. And it's a little more complicated for fintech or healthcare companies or learning companies because they have now dealt with the last two years where they have data about children. They have data about people's health information. They have data about people's financial information, how it was impacted by, for example, getting a PPE loan, right? So you have big tech Silicon Valley on the one side and you have the more traditional legacy companies on the other side. How do you make sure that they have the right access? How do you make sure that they don't find themselves in a surprising mode where people had access to too much information? So what privacy engineering forces you to do is it forces engineers to preemptively collect what they know they need so as to reduce that risk. Because what engineers don't like is a last minute surprise where they cannot release something because some privacy law was broken. It also reduces the risk for the attorneys because nobody wants to be the privacy and security attorney that blocks access at the last minute because something cannot be fixed in time for the actual release to go out the door. So what privacy engineering forces you to do is right size and ask yourself, why are we doing this? It answers the question as to why. The how engineers can figure out. The when business leaders can make prioritization calls about. But the why question is the hard question and privacy engineering gives you the ability to ask the why questions and work backwards from a solution perspective. Let me give you a very specific example. I consulted for a company that was collecting a whole bunch of IP addresses from their customers pre-consent. Now they were collecting that information to build a model that detects fraud, it detects ATO, it detects sort of an account takeover type situation or somebody trying to create fake accounts all the time. Now those IP addresses are pretty critical, but they were critical in the here and the now to block bad access right now. Over time though, you didn't need to access individual IP addresses and tie them to the device ID because what you really required is a pattern. You wanted trends, you wanted to understand are there aggregate patterns that we can see from a certain geolocation or for a certain product or for a certain business line? It lets you enable those trends and you don't need individual access for that. You don't need to access individual customers because whether it's a bot or not, 
individual focusing your strategy based on specific IP addresses is a recipe for confirmation bias or false negatives, right? So privacy forces you to think differently in a way that you can enable security, regulation, right sizing the data without abuse. There is no other vector I can think of that lets you do that. And if you get that right for privacy, you can then detect platform misinformation. You can detect false data. You can detect harassment and bullying. Everything we care about from a platform perspective these days is hard to solve, but privacy makes it that much easier because you have done the work for data ownership, service ownership, data flow, data storage all across the board. So the opportunity here is huge. If people can look past the fact that it's not just privacy, it's platform trust that you can solve when you do for privacy correctly. So to turn a little bit in terms of turning back to the notion of relationships and, and relationships within the C-suite and, 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 and down below, in-house legal counsel, always always important, always important to keep on your side. What, what's your recommendations for in-house legal counsel is, is how much privacy expertise is really needed in, in a large organization? Is it better to have external counsel that are really deep experts in, in privacy and going forward from there? How, how do you build a corporate privacy team? Um, as it is, not just the engineers, but what's the Absolutely. squad look like, right? So I'm going to add a bit of levity to this conversation by saying sure. that the most passionate arguments I've seen when it comes to privacy is not between engineers and attorneys, but engineers and business leaders. You would think that, that would be the case, but that my experience belies that. The most passionate arguments I've seen are between U.S. counsel and EU counsel. Oh, really? In house or out, out, out house. The cultural differences between how we think about privacy in the U.S. versus how privacy is conceived in the EU those gaps are pretty fundamental. And it's an interesting time to be talking about privacy because there is a macro debate on human rights that is taking place in the US. So I take that debate very seriously. Uh, so I would say from a privacy perspective, the way you look at building a privacy team beyond the engineers is making sure that the attorneys, the, the policy folks, the folks in PR understand how privacy actually works behind the scenes. So the way I think about this, the most, the senior most engineer in my team or the most seasoned engineers in the team need to have a lens on policy, PR, and comms that exceeds that what, that what you see on the policy comms side. So you, if you look at the Venn diagram, like if you look, look, at, look at it through the political lens, the most conservative Democrat needs to be at the right of the most liberal Republican. You need that overlap for government and ideas, efficiencies to work. Similarly, it is on the privacy side where you need people on the privacy team or the security team or the trust team that can think about these things beyond the scope of their team. And you also need attorneys and policy folks that actually take an interest in the engineering logistics. So as an example, are we deleting data? What does that actually mean? Are we archiving the data? Are we aggregating it? Are we encrypting it? Or are we actually destroying the data or are we delinking it? So you need both sides to talk to each other in a way that there is some shared vocabulary. There needs to be some shared truth in the Walter Cronkite sense that we can all rally around. So I think that's pretty critical. I would say you need internal attorneys who understand the business within the company, and you potentially need outside counsel that can place the needs of that business and the risks of that business in a larger macro framework. So, and this may not be affordable for all companies. So you need to sort of start where you can by making sure that the people within the company understand what the ideal North Star is, and then start building those skills. And I go back to the fact that not every company can afford to hire somebody like me or somebody who's a chief privacy officer. So this is about training your existing resources. So if you look at the book, and by the way, I'd love to mention the name again, Data Privacy, a runbook for engineers. My publisher loves it if I mention the name again and again. Uh, the reason I wrote this book is to make sure that everybody has that same shared facts. I've talked to multiple companies where they have me to speak about the book in Silicon Valley and beyond, and the attendees are half engineers and half non-engineers. And this book is aimed at starting that conversation where people stop looking at each other through a suspicious lens and use the book as a common learning point. And nothing would make me happier than attorneys and engineers using this book at the same time. And the goal is again, to upskill the folks you have and use that to build your team more gradually rather than panicking and buying the wrong tools or stopping the wrong work lanes or creating more investment in process that's gonna be counterproductive. So that's how I look at this. Like I said, very happy to plug the book. I enjoyed very much when I was reading it to data privacy. So yeah. The reason I yeah. mentioned is that every money, every dollar I make from the book goes towards uh, elephant welfare. So if you look at my screen behind me, this is the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Kenya. There are two more elephant sanctuaries I'm supporting, I've been supporting for a long time, one in Kenya and one in, in India where I was born and raised. The goal behind this is to make a better world, <clears throat> make a safer world, build a better environment, which is the same thing as building a more privacy-centric and trustworthy platform. Of course, that's a good cause. Um, so let, let's kind of turn this back then a little bit to another good cause, which is a career development, you know, education. 
Um, if someone is building a privacy team, whether it's a startup, whether it's a government agency, whether it's it's a large corporate, um, how does one go about? Um, you know, one does not necessarily go to local university and go to the Department of Privacy Engineering and, and start recruiting folks because these departments don't exist. But do, do you try to recruit people that move laterally from one organization to another, from CISOs offices? Do you take from a data office? Do you take people from other fields and how does one start, how would you start to think about building a, a privacy team from the ground up, which it looks like you've done several times in your career? Yeah, and I think some of it comes from the fact that I've, I've been in the domain for a while. And I'm yeah. one of those engineers that love talking about stuff even before like 10, 15 years ago when engineers were supposed to just shut up and write code. Uh, so a quick story, and then I'll talk about how hiring actually works. So sure. I used to work for a company back in the day that made GPS systems for planes and not the planes we fly in from San Francisco to New York. These were planes used by farmers. <clears throat> in the Midwest, and they needed to understand their GPS coordinates and spray fertilizer accordingly. And this was in 2006, when for the first time, gas prices hit three and a half bucks. Of course, I miss those good old days now when gas is six bucks outside my house right now. But I've actually talked to one of these farmers and the salespeople took me to talk to some of these farmers. And I actually sat on the plane and understood exactly why they were complaining about our software. So the UI wasn't great. The responsiveness wasn't quick enough. So they occasionally sprayed farms that belong to somebody else. So it's critical for engineers to understand the customer perspective, because when you think about privacy, your customers are going to be across the board in the company. So I tend to look at it through the lens of those farmers. And I remember they took me out for drinks at the end of the day and they talked to each other by saying, this guy went to college, but he's one of us. The fact that I took the time to understand their concerns made up for the fact that I had a master's degree. And I'm just going to let, let that statement sit there for a second where me having a master's degree was seen as a negative rather than a positive. And when I look at engineers to staff for the team, I tend to rate the internal teams first. The team, the engineers that routinely complain about bad data practices, the engineers that complain about uh, the company not doing their due diligence when it comes to data destruction, the engineers who complain about the fact that this company isn't learning from other companies' mistakes. I tend to look at those people. The people, the the heterodox folks, the contrarian folks who genuinely care about something beyond their job, I look at them first. And I tell them, don't get too beguiled by the fact that privacy and security are in the job title. At the end of the day, think of yourselves as being part data, part infra, part trust. If you can represent one or two or three of those motivations, that's fantastic. I've hired people in my team at this company and other com at Uber and other companies that used to work in platform security, physical security, global customer trust, global compliance. Some of these folks have no understanding of privacy. Some of these folks don't understand the tech stack, but that's where my job is to train you and upskill you, right? Just as I trained people six months, nine months, 12 months ago. So if you're gonna be looking for people with privacy or security engineering experience that goes back 10 years, that doesn't exist. Like Carnegie Mellon has an amazing program, Stanford's doing great work, but guess what? Google, Facebook, Pinterest, Lyft, DoorDash, they're all competing for the same engineers. And it's a small pool of engineers that is getting what they ask for, but there are more jobs and people in this domain right now. So I would look at people within the company. And by, by the way, I'm not suggesting that you poach people from other teams. Think of it as a 20% project. Think of it as a part-time job. And then one year down the road, when those engineers find themselves very, very sophisticated and skilled, they can come and join my team full-time or they can work for their existing team while also supporting me part-time. So you gotta be very creative because it's, it's expensive to hire people. Even with my reputation in the industry, I have to convince people to join me and not join another company because frankly, that talent that can work in privacy and security is highly sought after even to this day when the market is having a bit of a bare moment. So let's also then turn our attention a little bit to, to government and, and government regulation and, and policymakers and things like that. Obviously, your privacy is heavily driven by regulation. You, you touch on it regularly in, in your book, Data Privacy. And we also know that privacy is very much a moving target. It's a moving target based on, as you say, the Cambridge Analytica issues where stuff happened, you know, lag, 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 and then yeah, it got some attention. And, you know, the intention is congressional intention in, in front page of the Washington Post and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you, know, uh, you know, both, you know, with chapters within your book or even chapters that yet to be written in, in future editions or, you know, in other books you might, might write, what do you wish uh, regula regulators and privacy uh, policymakers should actually be aware of? What, what should they be tracking right now that you wish they would be paying more attention to um, overall as mm -hmm. you know, privacy grows as a community? So a couple of things. So first yeah. up, I, my favorite privacy moment in recent vintage was 2018 and that iconic hearing in the U.S. Senate where Mark Zuckerberg was talking to Senator Orrin Hatch. Yeah. And Senator Hatch, and there's a video of this online too, uh, Senator Hatch asked him, how do you make money? How do, or how do you pay for Facebook? Something along those lines. And Mark Zuckerberg said, Senator, we don't ads. 
And I was in a room with a bunch of engineers and they laughed about, oh my goodness, this guy doesn't even know how Facebook makes money. And I'm like, no, the joke's on us. If one of the most powerful senators, and at the time, Senator Hatch was US Senate President Pro Tem, what that actually means is third in line for the presidency. You have the president, the VP, the Speaker of the House, and the most experienced US Senator. So this guy is third in line for the presidency and he doesn't know how big tech makes money. That's a huge problem and that's our fault in the fact that we have done a horrible job of connecting with the world beyond shipping great products. So what I would love to see is some sort of a joint venture between the regulatory space and privacy and security engineers in the corporate world where we can exchange ideas and make sure that regulation and legislation reflects A, what is possible, B, what is important for customers, and C, in a way that does not stymie the one industry that always booms in the US, which is big tech. Big tech is a crown jewel in the US economic infrastructure right now. And there is a danger that if regulators make laws that cannot be enforced or are too heavy handed, we might stymie either trust or the sector or both at the same time. So I would love to have, like for me, after the, besides the current job I have right now, a dream job would be working at Brookings or some such organization that enables these conversations to happen so that we can A, build the right kind of engineers, B, build the right kind of tools and platforms, and C, have regulations that truly protects the customers like my dad that I care about. That, that's number one. But the second thing I would say is make sure that schools, companies reward these incentives. Like at the end of the day, a lot of companies across the world respond and give incentives that basically make engineers a lot more myopic than they need to be. Ship something and you get promoted, but build something correctly from the get-go in a way that doesn't cause issues two years down the line that often doesn't get rewarded as much. So when I, as a people leader, try to get my people promoted or get them to join my team, I talk about this. I, I make the case for it so that people understand that there is incentives in doing the right thing as well. Because remember, this is not just an altruistic thing. If Imagine as a VC, you put money in a startup and that startup is about to go to the hockey stick mold. And then suddenly privacy crap happens and stuff blows up and you have to essentially change your entire platform from the ground up. Uh, rather than having a unicorn, you end up having a camel. And the last time I checked in the race between a unicorn and a camel, the camel does not win. So for me, it's about making sure that people are more connected. This is not a skill gap. It's not an integrity gap. It's a collaboration gap. And we need to fill that as soon as possible because otherwise you end up with these things happening over and over again. And frankly, after the last two or three weeks, nobody can make the argument that our stocks and our growth models are impregnable. Let's do the right thing before we are forced to do the right thing by somebody who doesn't know what the right thing is. Sure thing. So to get a little bit more pragmatic, obviously this is a little bit of uh, something near and dear to my heart as a uh, you know privacy tool developer, both open source and proprietary. If an engineer is is or an engineering team or engineering leader is uh, looking at evaluating privacy frameworks, privacy technologies, is there a way that you recommend they start to think about evaluations of privacy technologies? I often think about cybersecurity analysts have this notion of the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability, access control, and so forth. You know, for all of its benefits and minuses, it is a framework that people have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think about that for, for privacy? Is, is that possible? How should people start to evaluate privacy tech as new, new solutions come on market, whether open or, or proprietary? Totally. So before I answer your question, I have a bit of... Uh an unsolicited nugget of advice for people who are in the privacy tech space. I talk to them all the time. A lot of these folks pitch their products on the assumption that everybody knows exactly what they know. And in a sane world, maybe that is the case, but really people who are in a rush to buy privacy tech either are buying it out of a sense of panic or are buying it to prevent something bad from happening without actually understanding what their risks are. So try and make your pitches a little more intelligible to folks who are not domain experts. There is an expectation because a lot of these privacy tech owners are technologists themselves. They assume that everybody else speaks the same language. So the collaboration needs to start at the pitching stage, not at the implementation stage. That's point number one. The second thing I would say is you want to make the argument based on metrics. How, do, how does this tool help you reduce your data size by giving you visibility into your data, by giving you visibility in terms of understanding who does what within the company? We all get annual physical checkups done where we get EKGs, MRIs, et cetera, because we want to understand how does our body stat compare to the ideal stat, right? But we don't do that for companies because everybody's too busy shipping stuff. So will this tool help you connect the different parts of the company in a way that historically has not happened? Because guess what? Once you grow, other things grow as well. It's not just the business or revenue that's growing. The risk is growing. Bad data is growing. Abandoned services are also growing. So will this tool force you to have that conversation in a way that collectively and progressively improves your organization health? So metrics around shrinkage of data, unknown services, 
visibility around access management, visibility around data sharing. Is it giving you more visibility? That's point number two. But third and most critically, is it producing outcomes that map to GDPR, map to CCPA, map to regulations, map to compliance contracts? So in that sense, you're reducing, not you're not just reducing risk from a compliance perspective, but you're enabling more business. I was at the CPTP conference in spring 2020 in the before times, and the CTO of Amsterdam, by the way, how cool is it that Amsterdam has a CTO, said that we are evaluating businesses, not just from the perspective of reducing past mistakes, but also preventing future mistakes. So it gives you the visibilities that you can get into markets that otherwise would be close to you. If you are looking at your business through the lens of future growth, privacy is your friend, not your enemy. So I would look at these tools through the lens of improving organizational visibility as well. Great. So I've been peppering you with, with questions as we kind of go through, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Is there anything that you would like to add to the conversation that's like hot burning issues that you, you like to advocate for, including elephants for that matter, but also for the notion of data privacy that you think is something that folks should really pay attention to? Uh, you know, obviously things that might be covered in your book, Data Privacy, but also what do you see as emerging trends? Like what, what should we be tracking over the next several weeks, you know, weeks, months, year or so? Yeah, so a couple of things and I'll talk about both insights uh, here. Sure. The first thing I would say is there needs to be within companies and within the tech community and within the society at large, a better connection between the engineers who build the products and the people who legislate or sell those products or build regulations. This, I mean, the reason I became a people manager more than a decade ago was to push back on this antediluvian idea that all engineers can do is write code and that they should not worry about talking to the customers or understanding the larger regulatory space. That's a very, very archaic view. And if you like the shape of the world that we're in right now, maybe that's a view you should entertain, but that's not the world we live in. I'll give you an example. When the Korean War ended in a way of an armistice back in the mid 50s, the decision was made by somebody called Dean Rusk in the State Department who drew a line in North Korea on the 38th parallel. So North Korea was gonna be one country and South Korea was gonna be another country. That line was drawn so randomly because it did not represent the topographical realities of the Korean Peninsula. Historically, the Eastern part of Korea was closer to Japan, was more capitalist, and the Western part of Korea was close to China, more socialist. But the person making those decisions didn't understand that. And they drew a line that continues to bedevil us to this day because the Korean Peninsula still technically remains at war. They have an armistice, right? So we are making decisions right now as an industry where the CEOs, the, the policy folks, the legal folks make those decisions without, without understanding the details. So there are multiple Korean Peninsula type situations happening right now. So make sure that the engineers are in the room when those conversations happen, which also places an obligation on people like me to produce those kinds of engineers that can articulate those views in a way that reduces risk. So that's something to track. The engineer should look at the rest of the company as allies and the policy folks should see the engineers as enablers as well. That conversation needs to happen until it happens these headlines, these breaches, these laws, these fines will continue in a way that will not benefit the customer one bit. That's point number one. The second thing I'll mention in the couple of minutes we have left, I think is people fail to understand how important elephants are. They are keystone piece, uh, species. They make the ecosystem more balanced. They create fertility in the soil. They protect other environment components that are very hard to protect for us. And if anything COVID had, has taught us is the fact that a lot of our future problems defy easy solutioning. So when you protect elephants, you are protecting the environment as a whole in a way that is critical for the communities that live around it. Uh, what I will say is that people who take elephant rights, people who kill elephants for their tusks are killing the long-term future in the service of short-term gain, which is ephemeral at best. So let's connect with each other from an engineering perspective for privacy, and let's be good custodians of the environment we have in, because last time I checked, there is no planet B. This is all we've got. So Nishant, you know, I know where we're time is uh, coming to a close. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, once again, I'll, I'll plug your book, uh, Data Privacy. You know, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the very case study based approach that you have in it. And I, of course, enjoy the very much the experiences that you're sharing um, in the book. Um, so unless you have any last words, you know, thank you again very much for your time. and I enjoyed this immensely. Thank you. 45 minutes flew, flew by a lot faster than I anticipated. So thank you so much. Very good. Well, have a great day and take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.